to see the Chapel of Royal Holloway for this service of choral evensong. Please do be seated. This evening begins the celebration of the Feast of the Visitation, remembering the pregnant Mary's visit to her cousin Elizabeth, also pregnant with John the Baptist, recorded in Luke's Gospel. Luke describes John leaping in Elizabeth's womb in recognition of his Lord, confirming John as the last of the prophets and the forerunner who bears witness to Christ as the long-awaited Messiah. This is the occasion for Mary to sing her song of praise, the Magnificat, which we sing tonight and every night in the church's evening prayer. Words from this evening's song. So shall the king have pleasure in thy beauty, for he is the Lord God, and worship thou him. is from Psalm 45. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, incline thine ear.
Here begins uh, the eighth verse of the second chapter of the Song of Solomon. The voice of my beloved. Look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stank. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of sinking has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the covert of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Here ends the first lesson.
Here begins the 26th verse of the first chapter of the Holy Gospel according to Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town called Galilea uh, in Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Our anthem this evening is Lydia Kakabadze's setting of the first Kontakion of the Akathist hymn. The text, an ancient Greek hymn originating in thanksgiving for the defense of Constantinople from attack in the year 626, through prayers to our Lord and the one who bore him. To thee, unconquered queen, I thy city from danger freed, an offering of thanks inscribe. Let us pray for the church. God, our Saviour, the incarnation of your Son brings joy to our hearts and blessing to our world. In your mercy, show your strength in our lives. Lift up the lowly and scatter the proud. Fill the hungry with good things and send the rich empty away that this world may reflect ever more closely the pattern of your kingdom of justice and peace. Made known to us through your promises to our ancestors and inaugurated in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for peace in our world. Father, your son said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Grant that we may be so filled with his gift that we may be people of peace in a world of violence. Instruct the leaders of the nations in the ways of peace. Strengthen us to see those with whom we disagree as you see them. And draw us together into one family of justice and peace as your children in the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for ourselves, for the work of the Hellenic Institute and the chaplaincy, for Paul, our principal, and the whole university community. Lord God, our Father, you have given human beings intelligence to understand our world and curiosity to investigate your creation. Guide us, we pray, in our seeking after truth, that our knowledge may be put to good purposes and our moral instincts may be sharpened and deepened by the comprehension of this world 
and reverence for the wonder of humanity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. So, my Lord, your eminence, your grace, reverend fathers, colleagues and friends, welcome to Royal Holloway and the 20th Hellenic Lecture. It's a great pleasure to welcome back the Right Reverend, Right Honourable Lord Williams of Oystermouth. On his last visit to Royal Holloway in 2012, Lord Williams was the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury, a post he stepped down from shortly afterwards. His visit then was to give our annual Magna Carta lecture on the topic of sovereignty, democracy and justice. Since then, he's continued as an eminent theologian, distinguished scholar and devoted teacher, adding to his extensive list of publications. Today, it's a pleasure to once again extend an invitation to Lord Williams to speak to us, this time as part of the series of lectures organised by the Hellenic Institute. Reflecting on orthodox Christian spirituality, he will examine how this rich tradition opens up new ways of thinking about spirit and body, prayer and action, worship and social transformation. The talk has a fascinating breadth 
and a lot of ground to cover. So without further delay, please join with me in inviting and welcoming Lord Williams to give the 20th Hellenic Lecture. Welcome. <laughs> Principal, distinguished guests and friends, it's an enormous honor to be invited to deliver this lecture for the Hellenic Institute, and I'm most grateful for the opportunity to share this with you. You've very generously encouraged me to speak a little bit about the book called Looking East in Winter, which I published not long ago, and if you'll allow me, I'll just say what I hope to do this evening in the course of this short lecture. I would like to say a few words about the book itself and its origins and some of the themes which the book addresses. But I would also like to pick up two or three writers whom I discussed briefly in that book and elaborate a little bit further on why their work might be of interest to us. And I've chosen, in fact, three modern Greek theologians as a tribute to the Hellenic character of this occasion. The title of the book, Looking East in Winter, derives from a metaphor used by one of the great early Christian monastic theologians. In winter, we look east towards the rising sun. We may not immediately feel the warmth of it, and we certainly don't feel it as we do in summer. The frost is still at our backs. But we turn east in the confident hope that change is coming, that the world will look different, and so shall we. In the course of what's now a longish life of teaching, I found the experience of looking east in winter a recurrent theme in my own theological work. From my time as an undergraduate, and then as a graduate student doing doctoral research in Oxford, the fascination of the Eastern Christian tradition has been a steady presence in my reflection. I've not, I hope, approached that Eastern tradition uncritically or romantically or not always. But nonetheless, I've found time and again a stimulus to rethink what appear to be the given parameters of theology in the light of a very different kind of Christian identity and discourse. And increasingly, in the last couple of decades, I found that issues being raised both in the philosophy and in the culture of the modern West have been for me profoundly illuminated by looking East. So the book itself is, to be perfectly candid, something of a ragbag of reflections on Eastern figures and themes whom I admire and who have inspired me. <clears throat> but perhaps the first theme which struck me as a possible way into turning all these diffuse reflections into a book had to do with reacquainting myself with one of the great classic texts of Eastern Christianity, the 18th century collection of spiritual and ascetical works going back over a thousand years, known as the Philokalia. The Philokalia, the love of the good or the love of the beautiful. It's a collection of texts spanning almost the whole history of Eastern Christianity. Texts on not only prayer, as we might most obviously understand it, but on what happens in and around prayer in terms of our understanding of ourselves as human subjects 
and human agents. The Philokalia is not just about how to contemplate. It is, you might say, about the kind of person you need to turn into if you are to contemplate. What do you need to understand about your mind and your imagination if you are to open your mind and imagination to the threefold God? You need to understand something about the mechanisms of your own insides. You need to understand the extraordinary power that instinctive reaction has in your inner life. The mental knee jerk, as you might say, which traps you in particular forms compulsive patterns of response to the world around. To be trapped in that way, in these forms of response to the world around, is to cease to be free in any meaningful sense. It is to be, in the old-fashioned language, a slave to passion. Passion, of course, meaning not simply intense feeling, but that thoughtless reactivity which makes us constantly the slave of what it is we're reacting to, and which works again and again to serve the interests of an unexamined, greedy, and sadly rather stupid ego. Understand that as the beginning of how you might learn to contemplate the truth. Because if you approach God without some measure of self-understanding, the God you approach will, to a distressing extent, turn into the creature of your passions. The God you approach will become an instrument of your own ego. So you better know how the mechanism works before you approach the holy. It's that dimension of the teaching of the Philokalia, which I still find profoundly challenging. And when I read the analyses in these Philokalic texts of how temptation advances and develops, I read them with a painful level of recognition, as I guess most readers do. But there's more to it than that. If you look hard at many of the texts of the Philokalia, especially those from the first three or four centuries represented in the collection, you'll see that that understanding of how the mind works is inseparable from a vision of how reality itself works and is. The reality of which we are a part does not consist, as the modern mind tends to think it does, of a self and a great deal of stuff, an active self and a world of passive raw material. On the contrary, the universe in which we stand is a universe that is always already speaking to us, acting upon us, and drawing out our own action, not just our reaction, but our action. A world, in the language of the period, a world of logos. In the beginning was the logos, says St. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the word. But the word logos means a great deal more than word. It means the active connectivity which, flowing from God's own life, draws together the universe as a coherent whole, so that every part of the universe speaks and communicates the life of God to every other part. That's the reality in the midst of which we stand. And that means that if we have pretensions to live a life that is logical, rational, logiki, we must be on the lookout for reducing 
that rationality, simply to our capacity to solve problems and get on top of situations. What if our rationality in a world like this, a world that is always already speaking to us, what if our rationality is a matter of learning to listen, to share, and to respond in a cooperative venture initiated by God? Two things, then, emerging from the literature of the Philokalia. A personal ascesis, an ascetical discipline of monitoring and scrutinizing one's own patterns of reaction and one's own self-serving emotion. And more broadly, a metaphysical vision of a universe in which the creator continues to speak and to share and to make alive. Now, as I began to write about some of these themes, I became aware that there were not a few contemporary theologians in the Eastern Christian tradition rather impatient with, not to say skeptical, of the philokalic tradition. The writer whose book I've just dropped on the floor, excuse me, the, the great Christos Yanaras, is one among others who has said that the tradition represented by the Philokalia is unduly individualistic. It sets up a model of interiority, which is in fact corrupting and problematic for Christian identity, a model which is, for all the wrong reasons, profoundly popular in the Western world. It's a set of texts which internalizes high levels of guilt and shame in certain areas, and which above all fails to give proper prominence to the sacramental life of the church. More of that later. Given all that, and given the understandable nature of the reaction of some orthodox theologians against a highly idealized and uncritical reading of these spiritual texts. It's possible to grant the questions that someone like Enaras is raising, but also to do as I attempted to do and go back to some of the challenges, intellectual and spiritual, which are still presented by those classical texts to the modern Western mind. And I think I could say that the first few chapters of the book which emerge from all this are in substantial part, an attempt to reclaim some of the tradition of the Philokalia in tune with some of the insights of more recent theological writing and reflection. Because at the heart of this is, for me, a recognition that the challenge posed by the spirituality of the Philokalia to the modern Western mindset is basically a challenge around what we think we know about knowledge. So often we assume, and our educational systems assume, that knowledge is effectively accumulating a set of skills which will keep us in charge of situations. What if knowledge is larger, harder, and richer than that. Many of you will have come across the extraordinary work of Ian McGilchrist, author of The Master and His Emissary, and more recently of a forbiddingly enormous book called The Matter with Things, which can, I think, quite properly be described as an introduction to everything. Ian McGilchrist is one of those um, neuroscientists who has explored and developed the theme of the different capacities and, you might almost say, tonalities of the different hemispheres of the brain. One of those who has pointed out that our contemporary society overprivileges the left hemisphere of the brain, 
granular, focused problem solving over against a right hemisphere, which is intuitive, synoptic, and in important ways, creative. And whereas the right hemisphere knows how to use the left hemisphere, the left hemisphere, unfortunately, does not know how to use the right hemisphere. So the lunatics have taken over the asylum in our collective Western brains in the last hundred years or two. The point, though, is that this particular analysis rings a lot of bells with the critique of certain models of knowledge that I find in the Philokalia. If our knowledge is not simply granular, arm's length, objective, in inverted commas, but participatory, sharing, intuitive, looking for global connectivity, then there is indeed something connecting the vision of this early, largely Greek and Eastern Mediterranean monastic literature with some of the questions currently being asked by those like McGilchrist, whose skills lie in neuroscience and indeed in psychology. So as the book develops, there are attempts to draw out some of the implications of that different model of knowing to restore some sense of what knowing as connection might be and to pick up some of the clues and cues in the literature about the ways in which the body is as much involved in knowing as is the mind, as I suspect any musician will tell you. But beyond that, there is indeed a whole set of questions arising <clears throat> about the nature of church and worship, which the Philokalia, you might say, takes for granted. To put it very crudely, the monastic sages who wrote the works in the Philokalia went to church quite a lot and didn't feel they had to write about it all the time. But for us, who are not on the whole monastics and who probably don't go to church as much as they did, it's helpful to have these insights connected with and located within a sense of what the active community of Christian people might really look like. So one chapter in the book is entitled Liturgical Humanism. It's mostly a study of a very remarkable, indeed rather wonderful, 20th century French writer, Olivier Clément, a convert to Russian Orthodoxy, whose work as both a commentator on public affairs and a theological scholar was creative, exemplary, and for me, over many decades, deeply exhilarating. If I may be personal for a moment, I, I still treasure an afternoon spent in the company of Olivier Clément when I was about 23, writing my doctoral thesis, feeling not only enormous relief at meeting somebody in Paris who spoke French quite slowly, but also somebody whose spiritual insight and personal warmth was so overwhelming. And I've continued to read Olivier Clément with immense gratitude ever since. But to call that chapter liturgical humanism was an attempt to build a bridge into some of the criticisms of the Philokalia style spirituality that I mentioned earlier, a bridge to the world of writers like Anaras. Because one of the points which Clément makes, one of the points which Yanaras and others make with equal or greater force, is that Christianity, Christianity is actually an illusion. At best, an abstraction. At worst, a fiction. This book by Yanaras has the title, slightly unexpected in a theologian, Against Religion. Yanaras, Clément, and others have insisted 
that what we are talking about in the Christian phenomenon is not Christianity as a system. It is what his subtitle here calls the ecclesial event, the happening within the world of a particular kind of human community that is called into being by the act of God in Jesus Christ. What is new about the Christian world is not a new set of theories or ideas. It is a new mode of being. Yanaras began exploring this theme in the doctoral research which he published in the late 60s and early 70s on the notion of the person. He'd studied for a while in Germany and he'd absorbed the philosophy of Heidegger at a very deep level as his somewhat impenetrable early style in Greek shows very amply. I've uh, attempted to translate some of it and I have the scars to show for it. But one of the Heideggerian tricks of the trade, if you like, that Yanaras has picked up is an interest in the structure and the origin of words. And so in his doctoral thesis, he discusses the word prosopon for person, the Greek for person, underlining the fact that built into that notion of the person in the Greek language is the preposition pros, towards or in relation to. It was Aristotle who first defined relation itself as the prosti, that which is towards something, that which is in relation. The prosopon, the person, is the face turned towards. And that means, of course, that to understand the personal, we have to understand relation. We have to understand that what it is for us characteristically to be human beings is to be on the way out from our ego towards otherness. And so it's, you might say, a fundamental condition of our humanity to be, in a term that Yanaras and others very much like, ecstatic. Again, notice the interest in the origin of words. Ecstasy is standing outside, being beyond oneself. To be a person is to transcend oneself in relation to what one is not. Well, this means that to understand the Christian reality is above all to understand the kind of human community in which that sort of personal life is being realized. And that is the church, not as institution and not as organization, but the church as sacramental gathering, the church as the Eucharist. Not just the church which performs the Eucharist, but the church as the Eucharistic community created by the sacramental action as it creates the sacramental action in a constant circling of life. So for Yanaras, instead of Christianity and instead of religion, you have the church. But be very careful not to confuse the church with the institution and those who run it. In uh, Against Religion, Yanaras has some fairly eloquent comments about the people who run the church and some aspects of the style in which its worship is organized. He's not by any means uncritical. But you see the point. To understand what it is that the Christian event brings into the world, you have to understand that there is a new mode of being human that is introduced. And there again, you can perhaps see the connection with where I began in the spiritual literature. What kind of person do you have to become in order to contemplate the divine mystery? Or as I think Yanaras would prefer to put it, what sort of a person do you have to become in order for the divine mystery to be active within you? transforming 
the immediate human community and the wider human community. It's meant that Yanaras himself has been pretty consistently through his long career a fierce critic of westernizing trends in both Greek society and Orthodox theology. It's meant that he has been extremely critical of the adoption of what he would regard as an unthinking allegiance to democracy and human rights in the modern Western senses of those words. And yet the last thing that could be said of him is that he's an apologist for any kind of totalitarianism. There's been a great deal written about his political stance, which is extremely complicated, I think it's fair to say, in terms of the contemporary Greek world. But staying for a moment with the idea of liturgical humanism, you can perhaps see why I chose such a title for this chapter. Clément, like Yanaras, is saying we need, in the broadest and fullest sense, a humanistic account of our human condition. That is one which is not mechanical, which is not conditioned by unexamined forms of power and authority, which is profoundly communal and mutual. A true humanism, but for the Christian, a humanism which is bound to be anchored in the life of the worshiping church, in the Eucharist. So, I've said a little bit about Yanaras, to whose thinking over many decades, again, I, I owe an enormous debt, and have attempted to broker a little bit of a truce between him and the tradition of the Philokalia. I'm not sure how convinced he is by my attempts, I have to say, but one has to try. The point I'm making is, I think, simply that the fundamental challenge of what kind of a person you have to be in order to function within the ecclesial event, that's something which they have in common. And it's out of that that Yanaras charges modern religiosity with an inescapable fascination with individualism, gratification, and therefore also with power. Part of the theme of this and several other books by Yanaras is the way in which Western Christendom has bought into that toxic mixture of fascination with individuality and gratification and power. And like a good many other Eastern theologians, he is very free with his accusations directed towards St. Augustine on that score. That's uh, probably another course of lectures, so I won't go there just for the moment. But I simply mention it to put you in the picture. But partly in response to some of the ideas of Yanaras, partly in response to a broader current in Eastern Christian theology flowing through the 20th century, we might turn to a second great Greek theologian of our time, and that is Metropolitan John Zizulus. John Zizulus, Metropolitan John of Pergamum, is often described as the most well-known and influential of contemporary Orthodox theologians, not simply Greek, but more broadly. And those who know his work will probably know it first through a book of his essays, published first, I think, in the late 70s, Being as Communion. You'll see immediately from the title of that book where Zizulus' interests lie. Like Yanaras and like some theologians of the Russian religious renaissance of the 20th century, ranging from Sergei Bulgakov through to Vladimir Lotsky, Zizulus begins from the assumption that communion is what is fundamental in existence. Communion, kemonia, comes before essence, before the solid fact. There is communication, you might say, before there is subsistence. 
That's putting it in a rather exaggerated form, though Metropolitan John is not averse to putting it in that strong form. But his point is that the world does not consist of a large number of atomized individuals who learn to get along more or less well with each other. The world consists of communicative life, which crystallizes in unique points of subjectivity, vision, and action. And those unique points, those personal points, once again, are the points at which the universal flow of life being as communion, where that comes through in freedom and fullness. Take that away or push it to the margins of your thinking and you end up not simply with a world of lots of little solid atoms, but a world of repetition, a world of mechanism and unfreedom. If we are not truly opened up to one another, if all we have is the static nature, which tells us the kind of thing we are, nothing moves, nothing grows. And like Genaras, and like others, as I said, from the Russian religious renaissance, Zizulis insists that it is the Eucharist which is where this new humanity emerges, is nourished, is witnessed to. And he has quite a lot to say about how the office of the ordained minister in the Eucharistic context, especially the office of the bishop, is fundamentally a task simply of convening, bringing many into one, as he likes to say. A bishop may or may not be good at answering letters, making speeches in parliament, disciplining clergy, appearing on Newsnight, or whatever, but the one thing a bishop has to do is to bring many into one, to be the Eucharistic convener to draw many into a single interactive congregation, witnessing to the freedom and the con connectedness of human existence. Behind this, of course, perhaps more explicitly in Zizulus than in Yanaras's earlier work, behind this is a very strong and very distinctive doctrine of the Trinitarian life of God. That which is most real, that which is most absolutely and without qualification real, the divine, is itself communion. It is itself exchange and interaction and movement. Wherever you look, you might say, there is no place that is free from communion. It's not as if once upon a time, there was a lonely God who sat in heaven and made the world to fill in the long winter evenings. On the contrary, from eternity to eternity, what is most real is most communal. I can remember the days when I chaired a committee on theological education for the Church of England, and Zizulis's work was beginning to make a great impression and there was a, a bit of a fashion at the time, early to mid 80s, to say that formation in theological colleges, formation for ordained ministry, had to be Trinitarian. I think behind that was a somewhat confused idea that if God was constructively communal, then really theological colleges ought to be a bit like that too. And theological colleges being constructively communal were a bit like God being constructive and cooperative. And I slightly despair of where to start with the uh, confusions in that. But there was, for a time, a fashion and an influential fashion interpreting this in that slightly, well, more than slightly oversimplified form. But the point I want to underline here is, is very simply that Zizulus builds on Yanaras's insights and the insights of especially somebody like Vladimir Wolski, 
to some extent also some of his own Western philosophical and theological teachers, because like Jan Arras, Zizulas spent a lot of time studying in Western Europe. And his building on Jan Arras moves us a little bit further towards that notion of a reality which is as such open, interactive, a reality in which there are no simple, fixed, isolated subjects, but always subjects in relation. He relates it to the shape of ministry in the church. He relates it to the language we use about God's own Trinitarian life. Also, one of the points which Zizulas likes to make, and it has some parallels with Yanaras, but pursues its own line. One of the points Zizulas likes to make is that the sacramental action of the church is eschatological. It anticipates the end. It looks towards the end, the climax and the purpose of the world. It doesn't look backwards. The Eucharist, for example, is not the reenactment of an event long ago. It's not a representation of the death of Christ on Calvary or even the death and resurrection of Christ. It draws that in, but its ultimate rationale is that it is an ecclesial event, a church happening, in Yanaras's terms, in which what the whole universe is converging upon becomes real here and now. Which is why, again, in the book, the very last chapter is a study of Zizulus's eschatological thinking. I always connect the theme in my mind with a very resonant phrase in a hymn in the English hymnal, translated itself from a Greek prototype, in which the final verse is, Alpha and Omega, to whom shall bow all nations at the doom, is with us now. The day of judgment is here and now in the Eucharist. And we stand in the Eucharistic assembly, not as contemporaries with the sacrifice of Calvary simply, but as contemporaries with the end and climax and goal of all things. Just in brackets here, it's a theme which Anglicans will recognize from some of the theological writing on the Eucharist by the great Gregory Dix in the 1940s. Though I don't think Metropolitan John had read Father Gregory when he wrote in these terms. I want now to pass on to my third contemporary Greek theologian, someone whom I've quoted in the book but not very frequently and haven't engaged with at the length I would like to engage with him at. And that is Father Nicolaus Lodovikos, a contemporary theologian, an academic, also a psychotherapist by training, and someone whose literacy and fluency in the language of psychoanalytical theory, philosophy, and patristic theology make for a very um, unusual and very stimulating theological style. He's a prolific writer. Um, I just have with me one of his books here, which is called Analogical Identities, The Creation of the Christian Self. And it's subtitled, Beyond Spirituality and Mysticism in the Patristic Era. Because although he is in some ways very critical of both Yanaras and Zizulus, he is entirely with them in saying that a preoccupation with spirituality and mysticism slips back almost automatically into the individualism, gratification, and power complex of Western religious thinking. And that is something from which we have to break free. Analogical identities is the title of the book. And that gives a key as to one of the things that Lodovikos is interested in developing. 
the self that grows on the soil of the ecclesial event, the Eucharistic community, is a self which is always constituted in dialogue. It is repeatedly recovering, rediscovering, reconceiving, reimagining itself. And that's where he takes issue with some of the language of the other two theologians I've mentioned. If you concentrate too much on ecstasis, the person going out beyond themselves, transcending themselves, does that not actually push you back towards the idea that first of all there's a person and then it transcends itself? Watch your language, in effect, says Ludwikos. You may be implying what you don't wish to imply and undermining the very relational emphasis that you think you want to support. And again, in Zizuras, says Ludovicos, isn't there an unduly negative attitude to the natural? Zizuras seems to be saying the natural is the level of repetition and mechanism and unfreedom, and the personal is what breaks through nature to become creative and new and all the rest of it. But surely, says Ludovicos, surely the natural is what the personal is. Nature is not something out there beyond the person. I am my nature. My nature is what I enact. What if nature itself is pushing towards this freedom, this innovative, improvisatory quality? And he has quite a lot to say about how the psychoanalytic world in which his first studies lay encourages us to think of the self as always responding. It's not that the self transcends itself in relation, but that the self receives before it gives. It is called, summoned into life. And one of Ludovicos's recurrent themes and images is that the logos of God, which calls all things into being, calls all things into action and relation. We are because we are called. We are because we are spoken to. And in contrast to putting the emphasis on our own speaking to and engaging with and transcending ourselves, Ludovicos wants to remind us that we are always as you might say, metaphysically, on the back foot. We are spoken to, we are summoned into life, and the whole of creation is summoned into a life of diverse modes of gift and mutual enrichment. At the heart of Ludovicos' system is the thought of the great Maximus the Confessor, the very greatest of the early medieval Greek theologians, who is the first to elaborate in full detail the idea of this fundamental self-communication, self-sharing of God in and through everything, the speaking and living vitality of the world around us. So that although Ludovicos would certainly go along with the priority accorded to the Eucharist, by Yanaras and Zizulas and others, he very much wants to see this as part of a rethinking at an even deeper level than the others of what kind of a person are we becoming and what kind of a universe is it in which we live. And it's a universe which, he says, has an eros, a desire, a yearning towards consubstantiality, another of those terrifying technical terms, but Essentially, what he means is all that is has a yearning towards harmonic, diverse unity. A unity which is neither solid identity nor oppositional difference, but a unity constantly adjusting, reworking itself in mutuality, in, in the play, as he sometimes puts it, 
of different substances feeling their way through the complexity of a diverse world. It's, I would say, a, a deeply musical vision of how the universe works. So, what I'm suggesting to you is that the kind of critical question about what sort of person you need to be in order to open up to the mystery of God. That question is heard forcefully, powerfully, in the spiritual tradition, and it is applied in the writings of these three great Greek theologians applied to the issues that face us today, not only in the church, but in society. Ludovicos and Dianaras, in particular, are insistent about the toxic effects of that triad I mentioned, individualism, gratification, and obsession with power. You don't have to look very far in the church to see how that works, but you don't have to look very far to see how it works in politics either. How do we, as Christian believers, and as reflective Christian believers, bring into our social environment a critique informed by these kinds of questions. Not by wagging our fingers moralistically, not by talking simply about a restoration of ethics, but, they would all say, by being, with greater confidence and integrity, a communion. That is, by living with an intensity, a sacrificial intensity, of mutuality, mutual hospitality, mutual listening, that displays the emptiness of individualism, gratification, and power obsession. And underneath all that, the evasive question, which I touched on right at the start, of how we rethink what it's like to know anything. You might say that a true educational community, and I'm conscious of speaking in the heart of a very distinguished educational community, a true educational community is just that. It is a community that educates by being communal. And an educational community that is simply devoted to passing on persuasive solutions to problems which is devoted simply to the acquisition of repeatable skills, has not quite grasped the point of what the community is about. Because to learn in community is to learn how to live communally. Learning how to live communally is learning how to listen. Learning how to listen is learning how to respond to the logos of God in all things. And it doesn't always translate into the functionally satisfying results that some people inside and outside educational establishments would like. And that's a pity, you might say, but we'd better get used to it, because that is actually what durable learning looks like. It may be, then, that one of the most important tasks that theology has in our present intellectual and cultural climate is to keep nagging away at this question of what counts as real knowledge, to challenge the facile oppositions of bodily and spiritual that feed into this, to challenge the privileging simply of a distanced relation to a passive material. I mentioned Ian McGilchrist there is, in fact, a surprising growing assemblage of serious scientists who would want to say that science itself needs reconceiving in its methods to make more space for all of this. Looking east in winter, nobody, I think, could pretend that we're not in a wintry environment. And looking east at the moment, in fact, 
reveals one of the wintriest prospects that we've seen in Europe for many decades, not the least of the horror and the tragedy of Ukraine is to see a putatively orthodox Christian culture apparently undermining everything that makes it orthodox and Christian in its aggression and its violence. And yet, our own resources in responding to this wintry outlook are not all that rich in a Western world in which, indeed, individualism and gratification and obsession with power and control more and more reduce our own social horizons to the mechanical, the functional, and the trivial. We need the hard questions about knowledge. We need also the radiant and compelling vision of communion. The Christian East, for all its historic struggles, its current divisions, the Christian East continues, I would argue, to present us with some of the resources that we most desperately need to rethink our own humanity. That's why it seemed to me worthwhile trying to write a book about this, and by our kindness, why it seemed worthwhile trying to share with you a few of the thoughts in and around that book this evening. Thank you so much for your patience and listening. Like to invite Emeritus Professor, Professor Richard Price to give the vote of thanks. Richard. I myself, certainly not a theologian, but an historian, with a certain detachment one learns from being an historian, one looks at the tragedies, the disasters of the world with a certain sense that they've always been such, and we can look at them, study them with fascination, but without being too emotionally involved. And that is the spirit with which I look at the extraordinary developments in the life of Christianity, uh, certainly in Western Europe, particularly perhaps Western Europe, north of the Alps and Pyrenees during my lifetime, which has been just a few years longer than that of Lord Williams. And of course, during this period, the striking development, absolutely unique in the history of Christianity, has been one lifespan that has seen an extraordinary decline of the churches, however you estimate that. A decline in the proportion of the population who go to church, a very great decline. A great ex increase in the number of people ready to say quite openly that they don't believe in God. And sadly too, those who do remain attendant, members of the church, Increasingly, there's a danger that their lives, how they react to the problems, the challenges of life, is increasingly less influenced by their faith than what it always most, was most influenced by, not by sermons, but by the whole behavior and feelings of people around them. When you live in a society where people around them react to the challenges, the difficulties, the joys of life, in a purely secular spirit, we are inevitably affected by that um, in a way that surpasses the influence of simply um, Christian doctrines, ideas, beliefs in our heads. Now, how are the churches to react to this very difficult situation which they find themselves in? Well, a lot of Christians react by sort of um, uh, t turning inwards, turning inwards to their safety zone. And the churches play up to this by keeping things going as they've always been, not raising radical questions, just trying to keep the faithful happy with what they've uh, loved and known ever since childhood. 
One um, uh, striking feature of this, um, though Lord Willems may know far more about this in detail than I do, because my own experience of church matters is quite limited, but within my own Roman Catholic um, community, when I became a Catholic in the 1960s and 70s, um, ecumenism was very much to the front. We must, you know, learn from other Christians, meet other Christians, share Christianity with them. Uh, ecumenical meetings were um, absolutely standard in most parishes, but that has now fallen aside. We all keep to our own little comfort zone. Now, I mention this in this context because, of course, <laughs> Uh, Lord Williams, Rowan Williams, is the complete opposite of that. In a, a, an age, a dark age for Christianity in our lands, he, if, if I may say so, remains a beacon of light. Somebody with an extraordinary, not only a huge knowledge, uh, but also an extraordinary ability to enter fully and sympathetically into such a range of different traditions. After all, starting as evangelical Anglican, I assume, and then moving more into the high church tradition. Then as Archbishop of Canterbury, of course, he had to be the leader of a church with a wide variety of um, uh, styles of churchmanship and uh, emphases in the faith and living the faith. He had to be the father of all of them. And then, of course, as his talk has shown, he's always shown a great and deep knowledge of Eastern Christianity, not as a tourist, but as somebody who was fluent in reading Greek and, and Russian, um, has, has really entered into the heart and the spirit of these uh, forms of Christianity. Now, in what spirit are we to do that? Um, we can do it as tourists who look on outside in a friendly way. Yes, you know, encouraging, very attractive to look at, but it remains essentially outsiders. Or we can concoct our own sort of fancy um, amalgam of the bits and pieces from there and there that take our fancy. Um, what uh, a thing that um, uh, Lord Williams has so brought up in so many of his writings is the need here for real a meaningful dialogue. Now, what do we mean by that? I remember being in a London bus and a woman suddenly stood up in the middle of the bus and started haranguing us. She thought clearly she was preaching the faith and you know, you preach the faith and some people are offended. Those who are touched by the spirit will accept it. There was no question of listening to anybody else. And I think the, what John Paul II called the decade of evangelization, that's what he was thinking of. Not the church having anything to learn, but the church having a lot to tell the world. Um, but what, in fact, true dialogue, as um, uh, Lord Williams has brought up so well in many of his writings, it is a dialogue, and it's, it makes no sense to try and share our ideas with other people, we're not ready to, not only just to share theirs, but to some extent to try and internalize them. We should be changed by dialogue, not just bringing people to our side, but ourselves, enriching, transforming our own knowledge of the faith. Now, to what extent can this be done? A thing which um, Rowan Williams brought up very well in his uh, treatment of the history of Christianity is that Looking at the 20th century, 21st century, I should say, we look back, shall we say, to what our favorite earlier periods, we look back to Luther or Aquinas or Augustine. Now, um, we cannot simply, uh, we neither want to say that where well, they agree with us, they got it right, they were paving the way and we are the, you know, the, the higher form, the more perfected form so far of Christianity, that won't do. Nor will it do to say, ah, oh, they got it right and things have gone downhill, in particular in the 20th century, let's go back there. No, we ha we, what we need to recognize is a sense that none of these expressions of Christianity are complete. Uh, yes, we have our own, and we should be faithful to that, but what we learn looking at these other ones, well, yes, we can, of course, uh, pick up new insights, enrich our own understanding of our own tradition, as the lecture we've just heard shown, uh, where uh, Rowan was brought out so well, what we can learn from these other orthodox um, theologians. But also there's a sense that um, they, we, we can't just be eclectic, take bits and pieces of them. They have their own world, their own background, their own needs. But 
uh, being aware of that and the riches of that, and yet at the fact that it does not complete its limitations. We should look at ourselves in the same way to realize that our Christianity, where we stand, is necessarily incomplete, and that all these different forms of Christianity are express, expressions, embodiment of um, something that will inevitably surpass our mental ability to imagine and comprehend. Yes, dialogue. Um, um, Lord Willems mentioned Olivier Clément. I once heard him, he was addressing the students, uh, a large audience of students in the Moscow State University. And uh, he was talking, uh, in, in, he, he, a most delightful, inspiring Orthodox writer, of course, coming from French Protestantism, an enormous a breadth of sympathy and understanding in that way, a figure, and a very um, charitable, ecumenical figure, in that way, of, if I may say so, similar in spirit to, uh, to Lord Williams. And um, one student asked him, what do you think of the dangers of ecumenism? Oh, ecumenism, he said, yes, every week I meet with a Catholic priest and a, 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 a Calvinist pastor, and we share so many things together. He lost his audience at that point. The young Russians couldn't understand that as, as a form of genuine orthodoxy. Um, but as uh, Lord Williams has brought home to us, we too, all of us who are, uh, trying to enrich our lives of the Christian faith and practice it. Yes, we need to, uh, to enter into this dialogue with Christians of other traditions in order to be aware of the, that there is a richness of the fullness of the divine mystery that none of us can express. None of us have the fullness of imagination and perception really to make our own but we can be aware of something, that what we know has its beauty and its truth, and that it is related to this wider picture. And uh, we need to attain a state of mind we're aware that we ourselves are necessarily imperfect, our knowledge is imperfect, looking forward to the age to come where our knowledge will be complete, and uh, we shall be, as we shall know God, uh, God will know us and we can look forward to that richness, that completeness that inevitably escapes us in the conditions of our present life. I thank you for your attention. Um, uh, I, I, I was first alarmed by being asked to speak, and then I realized this gave, us mar gave me a marvelous opportunity to express what I think we probably all of us who know his work at all, admire and love in Rowan Williams. He's just a beacon of light. It has been for me a great joy to have an opportunity uh, to express uh, what I think I share with him and what I've learned from him. It falls to me just to offer a few final remarks. I think we've listened this evening with such gratitude to someone who actually shows witnesses that theology that he talks about, that whole sense of reflecting on our humanity with someone who is clearly a wonderful human person, who's open and listens with warmth and reflects you know, with an enormous level of knowledge. It's been a, a wonderful experience. Thank you so much indeed. Your Grace, Principal, Reverend Fathers, Ladies and gentlemen, friends, fellow students, Father Orion and Father John, Father Andrea, uh, I was not supposed to say the closing words, but I feel that they must. Thank you for honoring us with your presence, all of you, and our deep gratitude again to Lord Williams, who gave us again much light in our hearts. There is a little reception at the roundels to which you are all invited in a few minutes. Thank you again. <laughs>